There you go. Well, welcome online. Welcome again here. We're going to have communion and sharing after the message. So I want to jump into God blesses those who seek him completely. Mm -hmm. So um, we've had some good worship, some newies and some oldies. <laughs> um, let's start with prayer. Lord Jesus, uh, it's all about you. It's for you, by you, through you. Thank you. Teach us. Holy Spirit, be with us, open our eyes, open our hearts, open our minds to what you have in store. And we thank you in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so last week we talked, started the Beatitudes, we talked about the first three, blessed are the poor in spirit, and we can't come to Jesus unless we get to that clarification that we don't bring anything to be saved. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted, and it's mourning over sin, because if you know if you're not sorry for sin, <laughs> you don't need to repent, right? So it's like part of the repentance process. And blessed are the meek, the humble, the power and the control, for they shall inherit the earth. That's what we talked about. The commentator would say that these three are like three prerequisites ent in entrance to the kingdom. You have to have these as part of being ready because if you are not realizing you're poor, you're not needing a savior if you're not mourning over sin you're not going to repent and if if you're not humble you're not going to surrender right and I was thinking as I was preparing uh, preparing for today that this also exemplifies Jesus that Jesus chose to be poor in spirit he was God he wasn't God masquerading as a human he laid it aside so he was fully human experiencing everything but perfect he mourned. He, uh, Isaiah 53 3 tells us that he was a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, but he also mourned over the sin of the world. When he approached Jerusalem, he said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I long to gather you like a hen gathers the chicks under her wings. Because he was so grieved for the hardness of heart. And he was meek. Talk about strength right <laughs> like you talk about power he had it and yet he completely humbled himself Philippians 2 tells us that he humbled himself uh, and, and came as he came to earth and came as a servant and he ultimately humbled himself uh, unto death on a cross so if we think if we turn our nose upon uh, to these things or if we're like wow that's that's a lot right um, we have Jesus who who lived this out, who didn't need to, but he did it. So that's where we left off. And beati Beatitudes, again, comes from the word beatus in Latin, which means blessed. Blessed, how happy are you? What a state of favor, what a, um, you know, like an ideal state where other people go, wow, that, those people are blessed. So blessed are you when you look pretty much opposite from what anybody thinks is a good idea. <laughs> But that's our upside down kingdom that Jesus is. So today we're going to look at uh, Matthew 5, 6, and 6, 7, and 8, the next three. And so I will read them and then we'll jump in. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, because they will obtain mercy. And blessed are the pure in heart, because for they shall see God. And so those are the ones we're going to talk about today. So, <clears throat> I brought my cheat sheet because there's a lot of detail. So, hunger and thirst, kind of like some of the songs we sang had to do, to do with that. For God so loved uh, by uh, We the Kingdom had it in there and some other things like hunger and thirst. We probably know what hunger is like. We probably know what feeling thirsty is like. But this is for righteousness, right? It's a, the word for hunger is a profound hunger, a craving. Like, it, it consumes you, that kind of hung, hunger. And it's what Psalm 30, 63, 1 talks about. Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you. I mean, as Christ followers, we should hunger and thirst for righteousness, hunger and thirst for Jesus, hunger and thirst for his word. 
So for righteousness, well, what is that? It's a spiritual entire conformity to the law of God and not in a rule-following way. The, the Pharisees pretended to be righteous. Well, maybe pre not pretended, but they were. it was an outward righteousness. It was a behaving according to the rules, but their heart was far from God, right? This is about your heart. It's, pers it's talking about personal righteousness, so wholly doing God's will, but also the kingdom of righteousness, Messiah's kingdom, justice for others, not social justice. Like that's the hot thing these days, or was, and then came in with the missional movement. And it's not wrong if you keep it tied to the right thing, but social justice, just to do justice, to do justice, does not help people find Jesus. And tomorrow they're just as bad off as they were yesterday if we only offer physical help, right? The church has, in some ways, has lost its way and operates like United Way. <laughs> we're providing the actions, but we're, we're, we're leaving out Jesus. And apart from Jesus, what's the point of the exercise? Because it's about the messianic kingdom being advanced. It's true justice, true righteousness being um, placed. Can you turn that down a little bit? Because people are going to pass out. And I love talking to sleeping chairs, but not. Okay, righteousness in the Old Testament includes relationships, though. It's right action. It's promoting well-being and peace, as well as helping the poor. It is correct relationship with the will of God. So, um, the, the concept with righteousness is mostly that you are right with God. And from that flows right being. It really, the original uh, English word is right wiseness. That's where we get righteousness. It's actually right wise. Live right wise. Uh, through Jesus, we receive God's righteousness and true relationship with God. It's only Jesus who gets us this righteousness, right? Uh, in Philippians 3.9, we read a righteousness that is through faith in Jesus Christ that comes from God and is by faith. It literally says faith twice in, the, in there. And in 1 Timothy 6.11, Paul writes to his pupil, or like his uh, you know, mentee, the person he's mentoring, and says, but you, man of God, and we can read it, but you, people of God, flee from all this, all this worldly distraction, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Pursue, like hot on the heels of. You know, this is not like, well, if it hits me in the head while I'm sitting, that's great. No, 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 this is like intentional. I'm after it, 100%. In Romans 10, 4, we read, Christ is the end or the fulfillment of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. Jesus is our righteousness. And then 1 Corinthians 1, 30, Paul writes, Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and holiness and redemption. I hope you, like me, put on the full armor daily. And what is in that armor? It starts with the belt of truth. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. But the next piece of armor is the breastplate of righteousness. righteousness. Who is that? That's Jesus. The belt is Jesus. The breastplate is Jesus. The shoes of the gospel are clearly because of Jesus. The helmet of salvation is because of Jesus. He's given us faith, the shield of faith, and the sword of spirit is the word of God, which is Jesus. <laughs> so... You can basically sink yourself into Jesus, like picturing yourself just being tucked into Jesus, and he is your protection. But that's the kind of righteousness. And what does this righteousness mean? We have right standing before God. We can boldly come before the throne of grace. I think we miss that. We so often, when we fail, which we do pretty much daily, feel like, oh, I can't go to God. No, 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 run to God, because you were never able to go to God anyway on your own. It's only because of Jesus' covering of his blood and, you know, righteousness being imputed to us, mean given to us, not because we deserved it, that we can run in. And when you fail more than ever, do you need Jesus? Do you need God? Jesus is the bread of life, right? So hunger and thirst for righteousness, how do we get that? Well, Jesus is the bread of life. So we eat the bread, and he is the giver of living water. So we drink the water. 
We're going to have communion later. We're going to eat his bread and drink the cup because he's the one who satisfies this hunger and it says, for they will be filled. And this word for filled is like saturated. It's not just enough. It's like you're filled to the full. But it's a satisfying that makes you hungry for more. I mean, when you're really hungering and thirsting for righteousness, what happens is that you just want more of it. Like the feeling creates the next level of hunger. You want more of Jesus. You want more of the relationship with Jesus. You want more of all there is. What, what we were praying for um, Harrison when he was... Uh, back in the day when he was full on in, into his addiction, we were praying that God would put into him, and he was on the street, a hunger and thirst for righteousness, a hunger and thirst for his word, and a hunger and thirst for Jesus. And we prayed that every day. And I would say to you, if you take one thing away from here today, do that. Pray that every day for yourselves. And pray it for whoever you, God puts in your heart. Because if we hunger and thirst for righteousness, hunger and thirst for God's word, and hunger and thirst for Jesus, I can guarantee you 100% one those pr that prayer will be answered. And you will be transformed. And when it's in us and we're filled with it, we're going to ooze it out wherever we go. Right? People will wonder, what's wrong with us? Let them. That's awesome. Let them ask, what, what's the matter with you? <laughs> what are you oozing? I want more, you know. I want to know about that but it, it starts with being filled to overflowing so that it can't help but come back out right so that's our God right and so then uh, blessed are the merciful and for they shall obtain mercy I think it's interesting that it's there I would have put it later but then you know nobody asked me um, Hunger and thirst for righteousness may be what it's saying is when you're righteous, that occurs to me right now, when you're righteous, you can't help but being merciful because you know that your righteousness was a gift and it was only because of God's mercy that we have received righteousness. So therefore we will be merciful. And so that was not something Pharisees were. You remember when they tried to trick Jesus, they dragged out the woman, right? They weren't merciful and they weren't uh, they were hypocrites because if they had been genuinely concerned for the sin, there would have been two people dragged out. Because pretty much when you commit adultery, there's two involved. Right? So, elios is the word for merciful or mercy, and it means compassion. Mercy in that way. Merciful is really to be like God, right? Who is full of mercy. The wisdom from heaven is full of mercy and good fruit, says James. Uh, merciful means to have forgiveness for the guilty and compassion for those suffering and needy. That's hard to do. Sometimes we're too busy. Something, sometimes it's too uncomfortable. We think people should know better. But, oh boy, with the measure you used, it will be measured to you. I'm pretty sure that's true for mercy because how are we standing except for God's mercy? And if he showers mercy upon us, how dare we withhold it from anyone else? Micah 6, 8, I assume some of you know that verse by heart. He has told you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to love justice and to, wait, to love justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. Do justice, love mercy, walk humbly with your God. And we are, have been shown mercy by God, right? Uh, God saved us because of his mercy, says Titus 3, 5. Not because of anything we've done. Not because of righteous act we've done. No, no, because of his mercy. And God, Hosea 6, 6, and Jesus repeats it in Matthew 9, 13. God desires mercy, not sacrifice. Don't bring me offerings or your good works, your religion. I desire mercy. I desire heart that's right. Because we have shown, uh, been shown mercy by God, we need to show mercy. And truth be told, which one of us can say we don't need his mercy every day? Every day. All throughout the day. Multiple times a day. Right? And so we're hungry and thirsting for righteousness. We become more like Jesus. We receive his mercy. And the more we understand how merciful God has been, the more we pour out his mercy. And then Jesus says, Blessed are the pure in heart, 
for they will see God. They shall see God pure. This is the beatitude I would say it, I struggle with the most as in, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I can see myself as merciful. I can see myself hunger and thirsting. I can do the ones, the five we've done so far. But this one is a, wow, right? Wow, pure. Inner moral purity is what it's talking about. In the New Testament, the word pure refers to the moral and spiritual sphere. The Greek sense is straightness, honesty, clarity. It's written in Greek, right? There's two apparently different explanations of what pure could mean, but I think the one that I resonate with the most is a single undivided heart. One of the examples is if you have fresh water, right? And you add salt water, it's no longer pure. It's no longer fresh water. Because any bit, a little bit of salt will make it not fresh water, right? So it's like that with our heart. It's a single, undivided heart it's sincere it's not doesn't have a divided commitment I'm not committed to this part of the world and to God I'm committed to God and that's a hard thing to do it's devotion to God it's complete devotion to God it really ties into the hunger and thirst for righteousness in my mind right it's 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 the no matter what following 100% because here's the thing well, let me go to pure in heart, not pure behavior, because there the Pharisees again could claim, check, you know, we keep the laws perfectly. That's not what Jesus is talking about. He wants pure in heart. That's why he says pure in heart, not pure in action. And the heart at that time wasn't necessarily the physical location of your heart. That's an organ in your body. It is actually referring to the center of things, the whole person, the governing center of all. The Old Testament sense of heart was character, personality, will, mind, the inner life, all of you, soul, soul, really. And the New Testament in, ha, has it as mind, mind, and the seed of intellect and will and feeling. It is the essence of you. Be pure on the inside. Pure motives, pure character, pure whole person. It's the right attitude of the heart. And it begins with the heart being broken and crushed, right? Because we are pretty proud, sinful, arrogant people by since the fall. And we don't get to the place where we're in love with Jesus until, unfortunately, our heart is broken and crushed. And none of us like it. Because actually, when you're, when you're in your side, in your inside, stuff happens where you are being broken you can actually physically feel your heart, right? Does that happen to you where you actually physically feel your heart being crushed? But we need a new heart. And unless the old heart is pulverized, the new heart doesn't come. Ezekiel 11, 19 tell, you know, talks about, well, take this heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh, a soft heart, a real heart, a pure heart. And now I forgot what I was going to say earlier oh there so the pure of heart it's really important for us to be passionate about that the full devotion because all of us probably have little cracks in our armor and cracks in our foundation and Satan exploits those he looks for those and then if we have, a, you know, if we are not fully surrendered in an area of life, and that happens to all of us, and over time, hopefully, more and more belongs to Jesus, wholeheartedly devoted, and less and less is still out there. But those cracks, he just pours in a little bit of garbage. And if you agree with it, the crack widens, and more comes in, and more comes in, and more comes in, and you go from being focused on Jesus, if you were, and slowly you're getting dragged out to see, basically, the tide of the evil one drags you out because you've opened a crack. That's going on with one of the people in our community, at least one of the people in our community, and, and it, if we cannot... have mercy on sin. <laughs> we cannot have 
a relationship with anything sinful because we won't make it. We're not strong enough. When we partner with Satan, we're going to get dragged out or knocked down. We won't maybe lose our salvation because I don't think we will unless you tell Jesus goodbye forever. But you are going to completely be miserable. At first it's tasty. Right? Satan is clever. Like I always say, if he came to the door with a red cape, orange pitchfork, yeah. I'd be like, close the door. I don't need you. But that's not how he shows up. He shows up in a t as a tasty treat or a, a desirable activity or something really yummy that we just can't resist. Because otherwise, it wouldn't be hard to say no. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't like chocolate. I'm not tempted by that, right? <laughs> so it's, it's the temptation. But what is the blessing for the pure in heart? And that's a decision of your will. It's something to pray for. It's something to repent often, right? I mean, come on. It, we, we can't get this right 100% of the time, but we can grow in that and be less and less interested in the stuff that is just no good for us. And they will see God now. The truth, of course, is we don't actually see God. That's not how it works. That's clear in the Bible. But we, ca we can, through that, have peace with him. And have, um, it says in Hebrews 12, 14, make every effort to live in peace with all people and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. And so it's a greater intimacy with God and seeing with the eyes of faith. We will see in part now and eventually, completely of course but and God will reveal things so holiness purity is renouncing the world and bringing all into the obedience and subjection to God James 4 7 tells us submit yourself to God resist the devil and he will flee from you people love to quote quote half verses you know God gives you the desires of your heart uh, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart, is the verse. And this one, too, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. The devil is going to laugh his, you know what, uh, off, if we just resist on our own strength. <laughs> We've got nothing. But submit ourselves to God, resist the devil. Full armor on. He's got to go. And that is ultimately, I think, what Jesus is inviting us to. Hunger or thirst for righteousness, for him. For living like him while we're doing that being mercy because we need mercy and then living with a pure heart so that we can see God so we can hear God God is more of a talker to me than a than visual and that's great with me I don't care he shows up and that's what I want for us I hope that if you take just one thing away that he that it is a commitment not to do better, not to behave better, because that's so much so difficult for us people who are, I'll just try harder. No, just commit to daily asking God to make you more like Jesus and be serious about it and he will do it. I think that's what these Beatitudes are about. I think our next slide is a communion slide, possibly. So if you're at home, uh, we're going to invite you to take communion. I'll talk you through it. And then, um, then I would just pray that you would be blessed. So the cup and the bread, God, Jesus took it when he had supper with his disciples. He broke the bread and said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup and he said, this is the new covenant in my blood. As often as you eat this bread and drink of this cup, you will remember me until I come again, said Jesus. And it's especially uh, pertinent since we're talking about hunger and thirst for righteousness. So thank you for joining us, and we will see you again.